So welcome everyone to Cloud Foundry 101 for Kubernetes users. I have the pleasure to introduce you to Alex Zinko. He works for Pivotal. Uh, he's currently a member of the Irene team, and he previously worked on the Cloud Foundry container runtime. And here is Stefan. He works at IBM. He also, oh, sorry. Hi. So here is Stefan. He works at IBM. He also works on Irene. Before that, he worked on BitService, and he really loves programming in Ruby. And I suppose people here know something about Kubernetes, so Kubernetes users. But let's do some quick refresher. So this is like, I hope it's typical like, Kubernetes application. And as you can see, there's like ingress, service, pods, and they connect to the uh, some database service using pods, and they have some secret to connect to it, and there are some invisible paths such as security policies, maybe config maps, maybe service accounts, things, and Docker. And yeah, I, I think that you've done it, and it doesn't look that hard, it doesn't look complicated, but if you introduce small applications, it's basically everything is the same, except code is different, and yeah, from Kubernetes point of view, they mostly the same, and all YAML templates mostly the same, with just tiny changes in the, maybe in Docker files. And what people usually do, they just do copy-paste, copy one YAML to another, copy Docker files, and I think this is a problem, and actually the question, can we do better than this and just copy YAML files? And the answer, as I hope you guessed, because on your on your own Cloud Foundry Summit is Cloud Foundry. Because Cloud Foundry can do it for you, and that because Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes are very similar. They were both based on the Google Borg, which was doing the same thing as Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes does. You just declare desired state of the world, and it will do everything for you. It will deploy application, start application, will run the code, and everything will work. And it's not only that. The common things, one more thing is YAML, because everyone wants to be certified YAML developer. And it runs applications and containers, both in Cloud Foundry, it's a container sent in Kubernetes, like basically Docker containers. And there are two main concepts, long running processes that has to be monitored and say, restarted if needed, and then to be monitored, they have some health checks and tasks that just execute once and when they stop, they stop. But that's, if they saw similar, you will think that they just you still use Kubernetes, but there's something that is unique to CF, and Stefan will tell us about it. Right, uh, so if you come from a Kubernetes world, you may be used to be able to do everything, right? Uh, there is enormous flexibility. You can do uh, all sorts of things with Kubernetes declare, whatever you want to do. In Cloud Foundry, it's a little bit different. Cloud Foundry has opinions, and that opinion in Cloud Foundry is mostly about the application developer. So this is uh, a, um, a tweet that is, I think, around four years old or so, and the concept of CF push is actually even older. And the idea is, um, Everything in Cloud Foundry is centered around that concept of the developer pushing code from the local workstation, from your, your, um, your, your hard disk. Then you push it to the cloud, and the cloud will take care of what needs to happen to that application. So this is like the most important opinion in Cloud Foundry. It doesn't give you all the, uh, all the points to configure something. It gives you all, only the points where it thinks you should have an essay about uh, how things work. So this is like the strongest point about Cloud Foundry. So with these opinions comes a set of things, a set of objects that are uh, present in Cloud Foundry that are important to know. So for instance, there's organizations and there's spaces and there's roles. So instead of uh, ev centering everything around uh, an operator, it is everything centered around the application developer, about that person that is pushing the application or making sure that the application is in the right state and, and additional things. Also, Cloud Foundry has opinions about routing. So there's a very well-defined way of how traffic reaches your application and how the 
uh, router knows about your application and what should happen in what uh, stage of your application. And also services is another important concept. It's a first class citizen in Cloud Foundry. Services are something that exist, that can be bound to, and everything that needs to be managed uh, to get your application to access the services. So CF push is that one single thing. It's not, of course, not the only command that you can run on uh, Cloud Foundry, but that's the main focus. Um, so you're, as an application developer, you're mostly concerned about your application code itself that implements the business logic, whatever you want to achieve. And once you push it to the Cloud Foundry instance, um, you basically let go and let the platform do its thing and make sure it's available. So this is what it's all about. It's about that user experience, that simple CF push to get your stuff over to Cloud Foundry. Another differentiator is that um, but in many cases, Cloud Foundry, it is about HTTP applications, applications that are uh, reachable via the HTTP protocol, which isn't to say that it's not possible to do others. Uh, there is TCP routing, so you can do basically also the arbitrary applications in Cloud Foundry, but the majority of workflows is really centered around the idea of there is a ap web application that is running. The next concept that is unique to Cloud Foundry is the idea of build packs. So build packs are basically another expression of these opinions. How should you go from your application code to something that, something that is actually responding to the HTTP protocol? So that could be uh, some HTTP server coming with your build pack. That could be something that needs to compile any source code or just bundle it together in, in, in certain ways maybe create a, a WAR file or a char file or whatever it is. So build packs take everything that uh, needs to be done from your application to something that is actually running on listening on some port, uh, maybe 8080 or something else. Build packs also make it easy to update versions of your application. So if you have dependencies on external things in, in the Ruby world, for instance, uh, there is gems, so the build pack will download all the dependencies of your application and make sure your application can run in the right way. So build packs are mostly language or framework specific. So there is a number of build packs that come with the Cloud Foundry platform where we express the opinions that we have around how a Ruby app or how is a, a set of static HTML files should be deployed. So if you have a, a couple of files that you just want to push somewhere and serve with a static uh, web server, there's the Nginx build pack or there's the uh, static file build pack. For Ruby, there's the Ruby build pack that comes with uh, Ruby implementation, also with the tools to download the gems that are required. So you can really start only with your uh, application's files and everything else will be taken care of by the build pack. So this is the... Uh, uh, some of the core build packs that come with the platform. There's also communi community build packs. So uh, people have contributed to the Cloud Foundry platform um, build packs about other frameworks, about other languages. And there's even the way to bring your own build packs since it's an open source product, uh, product. It's easy to bring your own build pack and do whatever you want to do. So does build pack actually create image for us, Docker image? You would think that it actually what comes out of that is uh, a container image, but it's not. There is one step in between that Cloud Foundry again has opinions about, and this is the idea of a droplet. The droplet is that intermediate build pack, sorry, that intermediate build product that comes out of the uh, build process. So the application and the build pack together, that, that output is what we call the droplet. And only once you take that droplet, and uh, add it to a root file system, you come up with something that is known as the application image that will then can then be used to create a container. But that's a little bit complicated. Why you just CF push and create image? Why do you need this intermediate step? Yeah, that's a good question. And the answer to that is actually that we, when we run applications on, in the cloud, it's not enough to care only about the application developer. This is the main focus in Cloud Foundry, but we also have people running the platform. We have the operators of the Cloud Foundry platform. And with the separation between droplets and the actual final image, we get the chance to actually update the root file system without bothering the application developer. So as a platform operator, you can patch your root file system, 
restage the applications and all the security fixes that you have added to the rule file system will automatically apply to all of the applications that are running, which is very important for small and also large, of course, um, platform developers. Okay, let's now talk about something that we come here to here, how Kubernetes features map to Cloud Foundry features and how it all works. So let's first start from the application access. So applications in Kubernetes run as pods and they're ephemeral and they're multiple pods and to load one of them, you deploy service, you create service in Kubernetes and the service then can be exposed to the internet using node port or load balancer or ingress and multiple options in Kubernetes. What about CF? Yeah, in CF there is one single idea of how application traffic reaches your application from the outside and this is the go router component. So the go router is something that sits there and waits for registration messages when your application comes up, becomes healthy, a message is sent to the go router and it will from then on will route traffic to that application. There's this one idea and that is central to Cloud Foundry and there is no other way around doing this. Yeah. So when you deploy application, you actually want to access database, surprise. And in Kubernetes, you either bring your own services and then do some secrets, manually var it, or you can try to deploy service catalog. And I think it comes from CF. Right, uh, so the idea of having services as a first class citizen, as an object that you can manage, bind to, and all the things, uh, actually was extracted from Cloud Foundry, and uh, there is where it has its natural place. So an application just binds to a service, and you can instantiate a service, and uh, therefore can access, you can access services from the application. You don't have to uh, deal with the details of creating that service unless you want to, and you, unless you want to become a service provider. Yeah. And by the way, if you want to find out how to bring your own services from Kubernetes to Cloud Foundry, so there's one interesting talk. Unfortunately, it's happening right now, but you can check the recording later. And since we started about secrets, so in Kubernetes, if you want to, usually when you connect to database, you want to somehow get the secrets and there's a special secrets object. And if you use some custom configuration, you use config map, which will create file on the disk. And yeah, there are also many more options. You can set environment variables in the container. And yeah, multiple options as usual in Kubernetes. What about Cloud Foundry? You could argue that there is not really a need to manage secrets in Cloud Foundry, because in the end, if you ask why do you need secrets, well, you need secrets in order to, able to be able to access a service. And when you have that service binding as a first class citizen, what happens in Cloud Foundry is once you bind to that service, all the necessary configuration as well as secrets get injected into your application's environment and you just have to consume an environment variable where the application can find all of the things that are needed. So there is not really a need to do that from the application perspective. However, if you really want to do that for whatever reason, maybe for some customization or for because your application is written in a certain style, there is other environment vari variables. These are called user-provided environment variables where you can achieve a similar configuration using a, a manual approach. Yeah, and then next part, when you deploy application, you want to be, it to be highly available. So you want to place containers somehow so they won't influence each other. And in Kubernetes, I wrote multiple, lots of ways because there are so many ways and they have very long names. They don't fit the slide, but it's affinity and anti-affinity rules, and you can base it on labels, so it can be on different AZs, or on same AZ, or in different uh, VMs, or maybe like some pods needs to run with some other pods, and then you can specify different priorities on the pods, so maybe some nodes will allow to run only some specific pods, and yeah, many options, many options. What about Cloud Foundry? As always, it's much simpler in Cloud Foundry. There is one default scheduler that's called uh, Diego. And as an application developer, you don't have uh, almost no say uh, about container placement. Diego does the right thing because uh, Cloud Foundry is opinionated and will make sure that your application is running on the right nodes and um, will make sure that it's, it's up and all the things. Having said that, there is one way to actually influence placement and that is the concept of isolation segments. 
so that you can implicitly specify in which parts of your deployment uh, of your infrastructure the application is actually running and how it's distributed. But this, this is way more coarse-grained than all the things that you have available in Kubernetes. Yeah. And as usual, for storage, Kubernetes many options. So it depends, again, you can use cloud-specific volumes like Google storage or IBM storage, or you can use NFS, SMB, connect, it's connected easily, or some other external uh, services like ClusterFS, or you can even use a local disk to store information. So many ways to store data in Kubernetes. In Cloud Foundry, uh, it's way simpler again because we recommend to follow the 12 factor uh, pattern or manifesto. And uh, that one says any data that needs to persist must be stored in a stateful backing service, typically a database. So what you usually do in Cloud Foundry is you have an object store or you have a database where the application can actually persist, persist stuff. Uh, again, there is an option in Cloud Foundry and that is uh, uh, created by the Percy project where you can actually do mount NFS uh, or SMB volumes. So you can actually have a disk that is not ephemeral, but kind of the 80% uh, of the applications that we see is actually not using persistence in, uh, in local disks, but actually goes out and stores it, for instance, in an object store. So, as we said, long run process is central in both Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. And to make it long run, we need to monitor it and make sure that it's can, if it's broken, it should be restarted. So how to do it in Kubernetes? There are two different things, liveness probe and readiness probe. If pod is not ready, it just doesn't show traffic. If it's not alive, it get recreated. And they both support the same set of checks. It's uh, either just HTTP GET, uh, just uh, connected to TCP socket, but if you need something fancy, you can basically execute any command on the container and verify that your application is up and running. Cloud Foundry, again, it's very straightforward. There are three types of health checks. There is uh, HTTP, so just checking whether something is responding via HTTP protocol on a pre-configured port. Then there is a port check that is uh, especially um, interesting for TCP. Uh, applications uh, that we discussed before. And then there's a third kind of check that just makes sure that in a process actually exists and the application is considered healthy when that process is up and running. Yeah, well, and also you want to monitor properly, you want to see the metrics. And in Kubernetes you have to deploy something, you have deploy metric service, but also if you want to use dashboard, you need to deploy obsolete hipster, unfortunately, and then you need to something to store metrics, so people use Prometheus, and there are multiple things that you have to add to the cluster to make it show you metrics and store metrics. In Cloud Foundry, it's twofold. Uh, there is, uh, of course, platform metrics, so something that is interesting for the platform operator and that is built into the platform. But from the application perspective, there isn't really a first level concept of metrics. So, of course, you can build this yourself and uh, um, make it part of your application infrastructure. And then, of course, you can use services to actually make sure that your events or metrics actually end up in the right infrastructure. But from an application perspective, there isn't really a high level concept that is sort of uh, available in Cloud Foundry. Yeah, and via metrics are logs. So in Kubernetes, logs are just stored on the disk in plain text or in JSON and on specific location. And then you can access these uh, logs from like directly. Kubernetes knows this known location. You can just run kubectl the logs. But if you want to forward them, people just deploy a daemon set, which will forward all the logs to some different storage, some metric storage, some Sorry, some log storage, and that's how you do it. 
In Cloud Foundry, it's again about the user experience, mostly as an application developer. So if you have an application with several instances, all of the logs of all of the instances are merged together into one stream of logs and uh, they get very easily uh, piped into your terminal. So you can just call CF logs and see all the logs from your, all your application's instances and you just switch the application name to see logs from a different instance. So it's all like uh, done for you by a component that, that's called Loggator. Same idea again, logs are a central concept and therefore uh, are catered for. Yeah, and then one nice concept that Kubernetes has is automatic rollouts and rollbacks. So there is deployment object, which allows you to deploy a new version and when you deploy a new version of with deployment, it will scale internal uh, replica set, new replica set to the desired size and downscale existing one and you can stop it at any moment and then roll back to previous version, which is very nice. What about CF? Yeah, that's something uh, that really doesn't exist in uh, Cloud Foundry. Um, there is extensions coming, as you have might heard uh, before, there's new features, uh, but right now there is uh, nothing like uh, automated rollouts and, and rollbacks. Um, it is trivial, of course, with external scripting. There is the established pattern of green-blue deployments uh, that you can use, and since the um, command line uh, of Cloud Foundry is so simple, it's uh, not very hard to build it yourself, but it's not part of the platform yet. Yeah, and then the other concept is batch execution. So if you want to execute some, some single run script, again, so many choices in Kubernetes. So you can reuse jobs, which will just run container with the script, or you can use pre-start script, which will start something before start your main application, or you can use init container, which will start before your pod starts. So so many choices. What about Cloud Foundry? No choice at all. It's just the concept of tasks. So this is, uh, again, a concept that is uh, sent side by side with the application. And it just runs to completion and does its thing. Yeah. And now we'll talk a little bit how workflow map. So in Kubernetes, it's very operator specific. You just have control plane, and then you can do whatever you want to do. It's like you can operate it. You can tinker can choose so many things. You guessed the answer in Cloud Foundry. It's again a very clear separation. There is two roles basically. There is the application de deployer or application developer that is also deploying via CF push. And there is the platform operator. Both use different tools, both use, use different metrics uh, and so on. So it's, there's a very clear distinction between them. Yeah, let's see the typical developer workflow. So. I want to deploy a new application Kubernetes. That happens. So first, create Docker image. Usually, I just Google it, find some existing Docker image, replace URL for GitHub repo from existing like, from that source Docker image to my own. Then I pull this Docker image to a registry, maybe create something. Then I get credentials for database because it's all deployed in Kubernetes. Put it in some specified secret. And then I want to deploy. I am almost ready to deploy. And I create Kubernetes spec file with like, it's my multiple YAML sections. It's service, all these things, as I mentioned. Service, deployment, policies. And again, I don't write it because I, it's impossible to write. I just copy some existing and replace names with said. It's very easy. Everyone loves replacing it. And then when I do it, I do just apply this file with kubectl apply, and then I just run this command and wait for it to finish. And let's see, Cloud Foundry workflow. I think it's might have in more steps, I hope. Yeah, that's all, you guessed it, right? That's all you need to do when you uh, deploy a new application. It's again CF push, and if you're using services, you only once need to do the bind service, so the application knows about the service instance, and uh, keeps the configuration for future pushes. Yeah, and now updating application because, yeah, for some reason you need to write new code. And I mean, if you run it in production, you for sure use some pipelines that will deploy it for you. But if you try to run it in like develop and follow and want to test it manually, so you what you do? 
again, update Docker image, maybe just uh, update the, manually build it and then just like, change the, to the new code, then push this Docker image to registry because it has to be somewhere. Then you change the spec, command spec to use this new image, then apply the spec and then wait again until it's deployed. Yeah, so simple. Indeed, it's simple. Oh, sorry. Are we missing a slide? No. <laughs> I just click and you click. <laughs> okay, that, that was a race condition. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, obviously, right? CF push, nothing else needs to be done in Cloud Foundry to update your application. You just push your code again. Yeah, so I hope now you really want to start use Cloud Foundry and you can use public providers such as Speedups, or IBM Cloud or maybe something else. And if you have Kubernetes cluster, you can even deploy it yourself. It will take 30 seconds. Yeah, you'll find out. Yeah. And what you got is you just do CF push and then I really need magic. And as a result, you have application in Kubernetes, which almost looks the same as I showed on first slide. Almost because we haven't finished the project yet. So there are some missing parts, but yeah, very, very close. And let's see how it looks. Unfortunately, we don't have so much time, but you can see the, some fancy names and yeah, you can take a pictures. Unfortunately, it's like three minutes left for the talk. We can describe it afterwards or you can just come to Irony Sessions. So check Irony Sessions tomorrow and or just find us and talk to us and we'll explain it for you. Thank you for your time. Here's the URL for our talk. You can see it. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Yeah. Feel free to find us. Yes. So, in some cloud if you question was why would you use Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes? Why would you choose Cloud Foundry? Why would you choose Kubernetes? So, if you just deploy application, I would say Cloud Foundry. If you want to experiment a lot. If you like choosing things, use Kubernetes. If you want to deploy database and kind of don't like Bosch, you can use Kubernetes. If you have something that really need persistent storage, you can do it in Cloud Foundry, but maybe in Kubernetes it will be easier. If you like YAML, you definitely choose Kubernetes. Uh, hmm, what else? But you don't have to choose, you can deploy Cloud Foundry on top of Kubernetes and that's like maybe best of two worlds. I hope it's best of two worlds. Yeah, but it's not as big YAML as Cloud Foundry manifest, uh, as Kubernetes manifest. Okay. Any more questions? No. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.